Here, let's say this is a tree. This tree has borne some fruit. Let's say this is an apple. If this tree has borne apples, it is an apple tree. Now let me ask you a question. At first, it was just an unspecified tree. But is this now an apple tree because it has borne apples? Or has it borne apples because it is an apple tree? It may seem to be the same thing, but actually there is a slight difference. It's because it was an apple tree originally that it has now borne apples. It's not because it has borne apples that it is an apple tree. It bore apples because it is an apple tree. So now, let's say this is a sin tree. This tree is a sin tree. In that case, what will this fruit be? The fruits that it bears will be sins. Man is a sinner from the day he is born. This sin tree represents a sinner. All a sinner can produce is fruit by the name of sin. A sinner can't produce fruits of righteousness. He cannot bear fruits of righteousness. In man's eyes, these may appear to be fruits of righteousness and goodness, but in God's eyes, they're all nothing but sins. A long time ago, a man by the name of Calvin wrote in his book, Institutes of the Christian Religion, that man is completely corrupt. In man's eyes, a person may appear to be good and righteous, but even the things that appear to be good and righteous from man's perspective are still sin in God's eyes. Man is nothing but sin. So, even the things that man produces through his own efforts, toil, and sweat are the fruits of sin, and this is what man offers to God. God doesn't accept these things. So what you think of as a righteous life before God, or a good life before God, isn't acknowledged by God. It's merely acknowledged by man. I think it's probably difficult for you to understand this. Please repeat this after me. This is a verse that appears in the letter to the Romans. Please repeat after me. There is none righteous. No, not one. You see? If you are not righteous, you are a sinner. And the sinner can only produce fruits that are called sin. A sinner only produces fruits of sin. There is something we need to understand here. Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they came to know good and evil. They came to know good and evil. But the good that they came to know is the good that comes from Satan, the good of man not the good of God. There are two types of good. One is the good of God, and the other is the good of man. So what we need to understand is what it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So if he ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he would come to know good and evil. This is the point. And if he knew good and evil, he would die. That's what this means. In that case, think about this for a moment. Do you yourself know good and evil, or don't you? If you acknowledge that you know good and evil, that means you are dead. Take a look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. But of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You see? It says, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, doesn't it? If you eat it, you will know good and evil, and you will surely die. This is what God said, isn't it? So let's think about this. Why do wars break out in this world? Why are there conflicts? Sometimes there are conflicts between parents and children. Sometimes there are conflicts between siblings. And sometimes there are conflicts between couples. Then there are clashes between one family and another. And on a larger scale, there are conflicts between one country and another. Why do these conflicts arise? It is always because everyone thinks that they are good, and they fight for this good. I am good, and you are evil. And the other person says, No, I am good, and you are evil. They fight because of what they consider to be good and evil, don't they? So, 
This world in which people know good and evil became the world of wars, the world of conflicts. It is today. So, what man came to think of as good is what is good in his own opinion. It isn't good in God's eyes. Even today, you have been living your life striving for what you consider to be good. Even when you go to a department store to buy something, you purchase the things you like, and those things you purchase are good in your opinion. And when you eat, you eat the food that you like, and that food is good in your opinion. It is not just a case of what is good in regard to morals. Everything is based on the individual's concept of good and bad. This is why the world has ended up the way it is. There is no true good in this world. What is true good? It's God's good. And God's good is Jesus. It's Jesus. There's no good in this world. But God's good entered this world. When Cain offered up a sacrifice to God, God didn't accept it. He offered a sacrifice that he judged as good. He definitely offered the sacrifice in a way that he considered good. But God didn't accept it. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 4. I'll read from verse 6. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So God was telling Cain that he had not done well. If you have done well, why is it that you can't lift up your head? You haven't done well. You've done evil. What you have done is evil. Sin's desire is for you, so you must rule over it. Sin lies at the door. These are important words. There are many doors in this world. Our lips are the doors of the mouth. We talk about opening our lips, don't we? When we open our lips, words can come from our mouths. Words come from our lips, but so does anger, so do profanities and curses. Why is that? It's because sin lies at the door to our mouths. So when we open our lips, sinful words come out. Our ears are also doors. All kinds of words enter our ears, and it is the wicked words and the corrupt words that we like to hear. Our ears don't like to hear the words of truth, words that are true, but they are very much attracted to enticing words and lewd comments. This is because sin lies at the door. Sin lies at the front door of the place where you live. A young woman may get up early in the morning, take a shower, and then sit down in front of the mirror to put on her makeup. She puts on some nice clothes, and makes herself look very neat and pretty. When she goes out and walks along the street, she looks like an angel. She looks beautiful and pure like an angel. Then she gets on the subway, and as it's traveling along, it jolts suddenly, and the person next to her loses his balance and stamps on her foot. Ow! Her eyes open wide with anger, and she shouts out, Hey! and venomous words flow from her lips. Why is that? What is inside that pretty, seemingly innocent and angelic young woman? When the man stands on her foot, she can't contain the anger that wells up inside her. The anger just explodes from her. Sin is following her around. We can't see it with our physical eyes, but sin is wandering to and fro in this world. If we could catch it like radio waves, we would be able to see that this world is completely entangled in sin. Is there anyone who would walk around calmly in this world with a hand grenade in his pocket with a safety pin removed? It could explode at any moment, and he would be blown to smithereens. When you walk along the street, your shadow follows you. If you go eastward, it will follow you eastward. If you get in a car, it will follow you into the car. If you go into a shop, it will follow you into the shop. 
It follows you around wherever you go. And sin follows you around, just like your shadow. Think about this. Sin is following you around like a shadow. But do you still think you are lucky? Do you still feel safe and that your fate is secure? Sin is continually following you around like a shadow, wherever you go. And this situation leads to destruction. Sin is your ruin. For a time, you may think that you have made a success of your life. But the problem is how can you solve this matter of sin? You have to resolve this problem of sin, no matter what it takes. Now look at verse 7. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Rule over sin. God told Cain to rule over sin. Sin is pursuing you because sin lies at the door. You must rule over it. This is what God said to Cain. Now, let's read verse 8. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. So Cain heard what God said, and then he went to his brother and told him about his encounter with God. But jealousy and envy arose inside him, and he wasn't able to contain it. Since God had accepted his younger brother's offering, but had not accepted his offering, a tremendous feeling of jealousy and anger arose within him, and he simply couldn't bear it. God had warned him about this. This was sin's desire. He hated his younger brother and wanted to kill him. This sinful heart arose within him, and God had told him to rule over it. But he wasn't able to control himself. It exploded. The sin in his heart exploded. So he just picked up a rock and hit his brother with it, killing him. The sin exploded. This is the kind of world we live in today. Let's read verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Since God is God, he saw and knew what had happened. So he called out to Cain, saying, Cain, Cain, where is your brother, your younger brother? It wasn't because God didn't know that he asked this. He asked in the hope that Cain would confess honestly and repent. God will be asking you about the sin in your heart, and your fate will lie in the way in which you answer this question. If, at that time, Cain had confessed before God in tears, saying, I couldn't control my anger, and I just went out into the field and killed my brother. If Cain had been able to confess honestly in this way, God would have forgiven Cain's sin. Verse 9 Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Look what it says here. He said, I don't know. I'm not my brother's keeper. He said he didn't know. Here, Cain failed a second time. 